sort of the American dominant media or the American dominant politics is, is another question. I'd say that uh, in the American dominant media, no, uh, mainly because the, the, the sort of ideological goalposts have been moved so far to the right that um, you really have so much you know, acceptance of the idea that the Democratic Party is the left. Uh, not necessarily among the people, but the right wing has done this very successfully. The Republicans have done it very successfully. And the media kind of follows along. I mean, the dominant media. And a lot of the dominant media is, is very right wing. So when you say that President Obama is a socialist or a communist or a radical leftist, which is very much spoken about on the radio, on television, in the right-wing press, and that has an amplifying effect, then, you know, what's to the left of a radical leftist socialist communist? I mean, so that means that people on the left are almost invisible. Um, now, last year, when Occupy exploded on the scene, that was quite different. I mean, and that was quite exciting, and it did change the political, not the political dynamic, but it did change the discussion. For decades, inequality has been growing in America. Poor have been getting poorer, rich have been getting richer, people have been, been getting more and more indebted. This has been going on and on. Democrat, Democratic president or Republican president, that divide has been growing. Organized labor, unions, progressives, leftists, um, have been making these arguments for decades. And somehow they didn't get traction in the dominant discourse. But these Occupy kids, with that very simple slogan, 99%, we are the 99%, and their bodies, and their joy, especially at the beginning, um, did create a kind of shock through the system. So suddenly people had to talk about inequality. People had to talk about the numbers. They had to say, gee, you know, the top executives are now making 450 times what their um, employees are making. They used to be, back in the day, 40 times. Um, and so this, and who's paying taxes? And how is this uh, affecting, how is the, the crisis, the economic crisis, affecting people? It's not affecting people at the top anymore. You know, Wall Street is back, their bonuses are back, corporate leaders are back, their money is back, guaranteed by the taxpayers. But the, but the plain people, the common people, the everyday people, are suffering still. Now, Occupy retreated the scene partly because they were attacked by police over and over in every city in the country and partly because of the weather and partly because their protest was kind of insustainable as it was. But I don't think that discussion has been spent. I think it still resonates. And the president, Obama, who had never been interested in talking about inequality or the poor or any of that, um, he was being very cautious, very careful. He was being pushed by the right. The right is more organized in America. Um, suddenly, at his State of the Union address in January, he started talking about income inequality. He started talking about the this great divergence and what it means and how destructive it is. I don't think he used the term 99%, but he might have used something close. So how the left is going to organize itself uh, is still a big question. It's quite, there are a lot of leftists in America and there are a lot of left organizations, but there's no sort of con concerted left, the way there is a concerted right. Now, the right is fractured, but it is able to get together for a common project, and it has been for the last, you know, several, several decades, but particularly in the last four years of Obama's administration. And speaking of issues uh, uh, not, not uh, taken under this, uh, discussion in this election, what are the main issues not, not taken uh, under discussion according to you also, maybe gender issues? 
Um, well, I mean, gender issues are being played by the right because it was, it's very useful to the right-wing base. So during the primary, you know, when the Republican, very Republican, various Republican candidates were facing off against each other, they had to appeal to their base. Now, the Republican base includes uh, a lot of people who are Christians, a lot of people who are anti-abortion, a lot of people who are anti-sex, um, at least sex outside marriage, uh, anti-homosexual. Um, and so that became an issue. Um, and you saw in states all over the country that um, Republican governors were pushing various forms of legislation which would limit abortion access, which would make the, the rules to get an abortion much more onerous. They are already onerous, by the way, um, which would make contraception uh, much harder to get. And so, you know, there was this talk that there was a war on women. Well, it was, you, you have to understand that some of this is actually believed. You know, so there are some people who are truly anti-abortion and truly homophobic. And, and then there are a lot of people who see this as a tactical argument because they really don't care about abortions, they don't care about contraceptions, they don't care about gay people, they care about making money, getting power, paying off their rich buddies. Um, Ronald Reagan didn't care about abortion, but he pandered to people who did. Um, George Bush, um, you know, Mitt Romney used to be for uh, abortion, he used to be for gay rights. Now he's against them. Why? Because he was running in the de in the Republican primary. So it's very cynical. And what is clear to the true believers is that it's cynical, and that they are used by these Republicans who actually have no intention of um, putting of doing their bidding completely. I mean, they they're not going to make the United States a theocracy um, as the Christian theocracy, as some people would like. They have done tremendous damage to abortion rights. They have done tremendous damage to women's health issues. Um, and that's, that's real. But I think we've, we've got to be careful because there, there is a way in which you can't, in America, you can't, re if you're a Republican, you can't go to poor people in the South, for instance, and say, we want you to vote for our guy who's going to take money from your community or from the, the, you know, the working class and transfer it upward to the CEOs. You can't say that. You can say, we're going to defend children. We're going to defend you against you know, the homosexual hordes. So this has been going on since the 70s, and it's, it, it doesn't stop. It is part of every election cycle. The real issues in the American political seeing right now, the real question is the question of decline and what that means and whether anyone has any answer for that. And neither party does. And neither party will, um, will, will face it because to face it is quite frightening. And it's also to say that they're top backers, they're uh, the people who have the most uh, money and the most power might have to take a hit. It is to um, really think about what kind of economy do we have and what's the economy supposed to do? Who's it supposed to serve? And also, you know, why do we have this military? And the wars are lost, they're failures, um, the soldiers come back, they're a wreck, they're killing themselves, they can't get jobs. Um, there is no American imperial power there is certainly the power to do a lot of damage, to bomb a lot of people, to create havoc around the world. But there is no way to bring the goodies back, not for the mass of people. And, and no, one has a, no one in the main parties really want to address that and really want to think about what it means to have a decent society and what it means to have an educated population and work enough for all. And so you've got a tremendous amount of anxiety in America, you've got a tremendous amount of fear, and you've got only very destructive outlets for that. And politics 
seems to have no answer for it. So this is a crisis. There's an economic crisis. There's a political crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks.